Hi guys and welcome back and today we get on with the build of Tamiya's 88mm Flak Anti-Tank Gun 36-37. So in this build video we'll look at all the steps of building the gun and the bogies and take it right through to priming the model and uh, just have a look at uh, how it all came together and what my thoughts were on the build process. And as a little bonus extra we'll kick it off with a mini supply drop. So I picked up a few things specifically related to this build uh, and the first one is the uh, new Vanguard Osprey Publishing 88mm Flak 18 slash 36 slash 37 slash 41 and pack 43 1936 to 1945 John Norris and illustrated by Mike Fuller. Now I'm a big rap for the Osprey Publishing books so I was quite keen to get my hands on this because I was finding while there was lots of photos online there wasn't a lot of close-up detail photos and uh, I was hopeful that this book would provide me with some of that because I had a, a, a thought that I might want to do a little bit of detailed scratch building to add some bits and pieces around it like cabling and hoses and what have you and sadly what I found is uh, the photos in here didn't help me in that regard. Now don't get me wrong it's a good book and contain lots of useful information so it was quite an interesting read and it talks about the history and the development and you know where they were used and in what, what sort of situations but the pictures throughout weren't any great help to me beyond what I'd already seen online and I'm maybe a bit of a heretic but I don't really like the the paintings and the artistic depictions that I don't I just don't find that that helps me in doing what I want to do so I left it feeling somewhat disappointed and went on the hunt to see if I could find something more useful. And what I then found was this book, the 88mm Flak uh, by Werner Miller, which is a Schiffler Military History volume number 50. And uh, it was much more to my liking in terms of the, the number of photos that I found very useful and some reasonably good close-ups, better than were in the uh, Osprey book. So this one is much more of a, um, of a photo book and just really contains descriptions of the photo. So there's not a lot of text in there and it doesn't provide the same history and background. So ultimately between the two books, I, I, I think I was pretty happy with a, a good level of information about the gun and its development and history. And then the Werner Muller one, which had much better pictures and close-ups. Ultimately, and I'll show a few pictures of these uh, now as well, I found another website after I got both these books that probably had the best close-up pictures of an 88 uh, that I'd found all, all throughout the, the research part. And, uh, and I sort of relied on those pretty heavily for some of the extra work that I, that I put into the gun. So um, anyway, always good to have these books, as uh, Steve would say. Uh, added into the collection. So we'll just have a casual flick through to have a look at some of the pictures then I'll get on to the, uh, the ones that I thought were actually quite useful from the internet. And last but not least is a whole bunch of decals from Archer Fine Transfer in the States uh, from my friend Woody. And really, really happy about these. So the first one is just German ammo box stencils and a nice range there, largely white printed in German writing and some of the stock standard Eagle sort of um, decals. So they'll come in very handy. Then I went with the German SS shoulder boards 
and uh, I really love the look of these. I struggle with my eyes in doing that sort of minute detail on the figures. Uh, so I've always wanted to try these out, and uh, they look really nice. So really keen to get them up and running, as I am with the German SS uniform patches. And again, they look really, really good. So uh, hopefully that will save my fumbling efforts with the uh, 10-0 paintbrush to get something that sort of looks like these, to uh, these things that actually look like them. Then we've got the German helmet insignias. And again, there's some you know, very, very tiny little decals there. And uh, I think the magnifying glass will be out to put any of these on. And lucky last in this little pack is the Waffen SS Panzer, Panzer Grenadier Divisional Markings. Now, the unit that was attacking Castle Itter was the 17th Panzer Grenadiers. They actually probably have the fewest amount of decals on this sheet, but it was the only place I could find that had any of these at all. Uh, and look, we don't we don't need all that many. A couple for the gun, and maybe one or two uh, on the Kubel wagon. So uh, all in all, really happy, and lots of other decals for future projects as well. So I've got a couple of other German tanks that uh, I can see being branded in SS divisional livery uh, down the track. So I love the Archer transfers. I've had prior experience with them, and uh, I can't speak highly enough of them. So that's the little mini. Supply drop, and let's get on with the build. So we'll start off with looking at the instruction manual, and uh, it's a booklet format, and the first uh, couple of pages have got some black and white photos of the gun, and uh, just a bit of the uh, history and origin story, uh, which is quite interesting. It's funny when you start researching any particular vehicle or weapon and what have you, and you're looking in multiple sources, that the, the numbers of like production and when modifications were made and all that sort of stuff, they never quite line up. So uh, I, I always sort of wonder that uh, uh, people who you know come out with this strong view of this was always the case and uh, can't be anything else. Uh, it's only something that they've read that's been written by someone else who has interpreted whatever they've read. So I think it's interesting, but uh, I don't think you'd hang your head on it as being definitively and 100% accurate all the time. And the first part of the instructions, uh, steps one through six, are about building the Zundap motorcycle and the figure that comes with that. Now, I don't need that for this dio, so I'll uh, just tuck that away in the spares box for potentially future use. And then we move into the gun itself with the completing the gun base carriage and the outrigger arms as well. And just need to be careful because there's a few elements here that you uh, don't glue, that you need to leave them. If, well, I mean, you could glue them if you wanted to, but if you want them to be uh, articulate, you don't glue them, and that means you can have the outrigger arms up or down, and that depends on what you want to depict the weapon doing, whether it's in transit or uh, it's getting set up to fire or it's in the firing position. So... I decided right from the get-go that if there was something that could move, I wanted to make sure that it did move, because even at this stage, I still haven't exactly made up my mind how I want the gun to be displayed in the diorama. I think I'm figuring it out, but I'm not 100% sure yet. And then steps five through seven are about assembling the gun base parts, uh, the barrel, and then starting to fix bits and pieces onto the uh, side plates. And again, just need to be careful because here you've got some choices to make about whether you're going to build the FLAC 36 or the FLAC 37. I decided I'd build the 36 for no particular reason, other than I think it was probably more likely. Uh, th there's no definitive statement about what type of gun it was at the attack on Castle Itter, but my gut feeling is telling me it's more likely to be the 36 which was more likely to be deployed in the anti-tank role than the 37. Uh, but I'm no expert. That's just what I've gathered from what I can read. And again, just a, a few little parts that um, you don't glue. And I guess the one comment I'd have about the instructions is there's a little inconsistency throughout as to the symbols used for... Uh, in some cases, there'll be a little don't glue symbol. In other cases, it'll be just written somewhere in the diagrammatic part of the uh, instructions. And then in other cases, it's even written in the left-hand column where the actual pictures of the what it should look like when it's finished. So I just sort of 
realized that early on and decided, okay, I need to really read through this carefully, highlight the bits that I could trip up over, and make sure that I don't mess up uh, along the way. I guess one of the things I would say is that, look, it's a Tamiya kit, so it goes together really well. But this doesn't have the, I guess, what we've become more accustomed to in modern times, the beautiful fit that you uh, used to. It fits together well. The instructions are clear. There's certainly no risk of any ambiguity. But, yeah, just some of the fit, some of the parts coming together aren't a real super clean fit, which, you know, that, that can be fixed up. That's all part of the joy of modelling. But, yeah, it sort of didn't detract from building the kit in any way, shape or form, but it was more an observation that, all right, well, this... Now, this is clearly an old set of moulds, and I guess they're showing the sign of uh, you know, many, many, many years of use. But, uh, yeah, just something to keep an eye out for. Uh, a lot of test fitting first, just to make sure you don't have any catastrophic uh, blunders along the way. There's also a separate blue sheet of instructions, uh, which are supplementary instructions, I guess, or notice of parts updated. Uh, and they come into effect at step 3 and step 10. And it's really just a couple of minor changes to the original instructions and a couple of new little parts, which I think are a really good improvement, especially the one that we'll have a look at shortly in step 10. So then we go through steps 8, 9, 10 and 11, and that's the assembly of the uh, gun carriage and the automatic rammer and then completing the top part of the carriage. And again, a couple of things here highlighted that are movable, so not to be glued. And the inclusion of the additional parts for step 10, which is really just two little plastic pins, part A77. In the original instructions, it asks you to use the warmed up end of a screwdriver to sort of seal the pin after you've put the movable arm on. And in the revised instructions, that pin doesn't exist hanging off the gun carriage. It's now a hole. And uh, you've got this little A77 pin to stick in. I just put a tiny, tiny little dot of glue on the very end of the pin, slipped it through the movable arm, and it uh, worked an absolute treat. And then pretty much into the, um, into the finishing stages for the gun itself, sections 12, 13, and 14, it's really about getting the gun shield right, putting all what I would you know, generalise as all the little gribbly bits on that make it look uh, really cool. And, yeah, just again, mindful of the fact that there's a few moving parts there, so you have to be careful about where you go splashing the glue around. But having said all the things I've said about the, you know, the age of it and maybe the fit thing, everything that was supposed to move ha had really good fit. So there was never any sort of, well, this is never going to work, I can't get this to fit or it's not going to stay or, or whatever. All that worked really well. So very happy with how that turned out. <laughs> So then we move through into the construction of the two bogies, and honestly, uh, uber straightforward. Uh, some really pronounced seam lines on the axles, so you're really not going to see them. Uh, it's funny, I think we're all the same. Even though in my head, as I'm doing it, I'm saying, why are you cleaning this up? Because no one's ever going to see it. I find it very difficult to not clean it up anyway. So anyway, I clean them up, and no one will ever see them. But... Uh, you can see what's going on as well as uh, as I can display it. It's pretty straightforward, so just some pictures of the parts cleaned up off the sprue, and then in keeping with the theme of what I've been doing, uh, what it looks like when it's finished, and I might even give some action footage of me doing a screw-up in the final installation of the gun base onto the bogies.
And so here she is on a, uh, we'll do a couple of whizzes around on the turntable before I do the priming and then come back with the uh, primed version of it. So look, really good fun to make. Found myself sincerely quite nostalgic about the, the you know, almost what, 40 something years ago, 42 years ago when I first made it. And I would think quite happy. I'm really looking forward to the painting and getting some of those decals on. And, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, my fingers crossed, I think it'll look really good. So that's pretty much it. We'll do a couple of laps of the uh, primed version and um, come back and say goodbye. And I primed it in the... Uh, pale grey mainly because I wanted to see there's lots of joins of barrels and round uh, connections and the priming typically will bring out any failure of my gluing them together and you know removing the seam lines and doing the sanding and filing and what have you uh, so you can see there's a few bits here that are uh, touched up and they'll get re-primed before but I wanted to show you the post priming post touch up because I think sometimes you know especially if you just near you prime it and you sort of think oh well there's you know there's a bit of a mark there or a seam or something like that but might think oh well it's too late now I've primed it and I've just got to forge your head but there's no harm in sanding it and then giving it another light priming later on the priming I think is a really important step in getting the uh, the overall quality of the finish right So that's it guys, uh, thank you very much for watching, I hope you found it enjoyable and sort of the coming sequence will be I want to build the Kubel wagon next, so I've got the two main pieces in terms of the diorama done, uh, so that'll be a pretty short uh, sharp video. Then I want to build the dio base it's become clearer in my mind what the scene looks like, but I want to be building it with both the gun and the vehicle ready to position while the clay is still soft, so I can make sure I get them right and, you know, the gun in particular sort of level and not look like it's just balancing on top of terrain, but it's, you know, properly uh, in place. And then will come the figures and then probably uh, the sort of bringing everything together and the final reveal. So I think maybe four more videos after this one and that will see the entire dio finished. And uh, while I'm waiting for bits and bobs to dry, my intent is to also do a little bit more work on the Haladonian 1-144 fighters. So you might see some of that pop up along the way as well. So again, thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hope you enjoyed it. So like if you like. Uh, sub if you're not already sub so you can keep current and get alerts for when new videos come out and uh, yeah, as you guys know really look forward to your comments and we'll respond to each and every one of them so take care everyone and i will catch you on the next one cheers